Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the legendary trainer, the great Teddy Atlas. And today is a special year in review episode brought to you by Teddy's audiobook. Check it out Atlas from the Streets to the Ring, A Son's Journey to Become a Man. It's an awesome book. Check it out. Available on Apple, iTunes, as well as audible.com. It's really entertaining. If you like doing any kind of endurance sports, running, riding your bike, this is awesome to listen to while you're training. Teddy, good to be with you. Good to be with you. And uh, talking about the year and everything, you see 74? Yep. I love these. Um, my late great friend, George Horowitz, who used to be the owner CEO of Everlast, he really was the man who was responsible for, for the uh, comeback of Everlast. Everlast is a great company, been around a long time, over 100 years I think it is, but uh, he gave it a resurgence, a resurgence when he took it over and redid the equipment, which was out of date and all kinds of everything. And he really did a great job and he passed away way too early with, with kidney cancer. But um, he made this line, it was a throwback line, you know, and I'll turn around so the people will see why I think it's so great. Zaire 74. He, he made all these lines, Manila, Zaire, and obviously uh, I wear old stuff. You know? <laughs> I, I, I kept it in good shape, and I figured let me, uh, let me wear it today so I could, I could tell that story. 1974, the year I graduated high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, before we came here, uh, before I came to the city today, I um, I had a beard over the um, over the break, and it was all gray. And it's, I mean, I don't think of myself as old. I know, I know I'm old. I know you didn't graduate high school that year because <laughs> I graduated in '75. <laughs> so I had this beard, and I, um, as we discussed before, I ran a race, and I'm running the race now. Again, the beard's gray, but I don't think of myself as old. And as I'm running, some freaking guy on the side of the road was being sincere. He's like, "Yes." Win it for the old guys. And I was like, <laughs> F you, buddy. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to win it for the old guys. I'm going to win it for all guys. <laughs> yeah. oh, you did a great job. So then I was like, okay. this beard's got to go. <laughs> my wife said, put in some of that um, just for men. I said, oh, my beard is weird. <laughs> it's not what's on the outside. It's exactly. what's on the inside, That's baby. Right. And I don't feel old. So we're going to keep training. Anyway, I want to talk to you today about some of the uh, fights of the year. I think as a whole, 2019 was an excellent year of fighting. And um, one of the bonuses for the fans has been, you know, look, the streaming services, they charge money. In the grand scheme of things, I don't think it's a lot for what you get. But nevertheless, the competition has created a ton of outlets for fights. Not necessarily all competitive, but more or less we have reasonably good fights every single weekend or at least names that you know almost every weekend and um we had some really good ones and i want to recap maybe the top three to five fights with you see which one you thought was the best fight of the year and maybe at the end we'll talk about who you have for the upset and fighter of the year and um but let's start with um some of the top fights of the year for you i'll uh weigh in where appropriate but i know that people are tuning in here to see what teddy atlas thinks not what ken rideout thinks so Talk to me about some of your favorite fights this year. I'm not going to put them in order right away. Cool. But, but I just and then we'll figure out the order. M maybe I'll do it like the, the way that they used to do things, that I thought there was always a little bit more theater to it. I'll start at the bottom and work my way up. Sure. Maybe that's it. So I, I figured we'd pick five. Yep. But uh, then it became a 5A. And a, five, <laughs> and a 5B. That always happens with me. And for the fans, just as a quick aside, we haven't discussed this beforehand. No. As you probably know, we're like wing it a lot, which I think creates a lot of uh, organic good material is, you know, we're not like following a script per se. So um, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. I have my own thoughts, but I'm as curious as the fans are to hear what, which ones you um, appreciated the most last year. Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in, this is not my top, and and I realize it might be five A and C and B mm -hmm. and C, but um, I'm gonna put Pacquiao and Porter in there only because of the surprise theater. That I'm not saying it was a great fight. The funny thing, the weird thing, if you would have told me or you or, or you before the fight that it was gonna be a one sided fight, nobody would have been shocked. But what they would have been shocked was that the one side was Pacquiao's side. Hundred. That they would have been shocked. Oh yeah. So for me, the interest of that the. the just the unexpected theater of that, uh, that that's got to be on the radar. 
you know, that a 40-year-old Pacquiao, you know, um, I don't know what he's eating for breakfast. It ain't Cheerios. <laughs> I want to that's get, a, that's wait, a whole uh, other topic. Uh, that's a whole other show. topic. You, all, all you great Filipino <clears throat> fans, Pacquiao fans, love you. Please. Oh, it's, calm, too, it's too late for that. Calm, You're please, already like, calm on down. the hit list. <laughs> calm down. Okay? I love Pacquiao. But, um, but man, he looked good for 40, didn't he? <laughs> wow. Wow. So, uh, listen, to his credit, hey, look, Porter was coming off inactivity. He only had one Thurman. fight back. Thurman yeah. was coming off inactivity. Only had one fight back. Uh, it wasn't good. He, he almost lost. Yeah, he, he didn't all look right. good at all. Uh, so maybe he needed another fight in hindsight. But who knows? He can't take nothing away from Pacquiao. So that's on the radar. Another one that's on the radar, and it has to be for me. Uh, and it was a listen. It could be a candidate for fight of the year. But I'm not saying that. It had enough of. There's different elements for fight of the year. You know, it's it's got to have theater. It's got to have the drama, the excitement, uh, maybe surprise factor. You know, uh, upsets are always great. Uh, the unexpected, but you know, it's it's also got to have you know talent uh, and and just good craftsmanship. You know. If you're going to go for carpenter of the year, you don't want a guy, you know, hitting the side of the wall more than he's hitting the nail. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. Uh, you want him to hit the nail. Yeah. Not be putting dents in, 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 in all your wood, you know, by missing the nail. So it, it's about those things, too. You know, it's, it's like fighter of the year, you know, or pound for pound fighter. What people used to say, oh, Teddy, you, you, what about, you know, Golovkin? He should be pound for pound. I had him up there. The, when when he was a little younger, but then I also weighed in that he was beating junior middleweights, you know. So part of it is who's you're fighting, what's the competition, and then uh, he was beating junior middleweights for a while there. Uh, so was it his physicality that was great, that was greater than his overall fighting ability or 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 technique or or his approach you know because if you say pound for pound it's got to be more than just the guy that's stronger than everybody else so i i brought golovkin down a lot of people hated me they went after me they were like oh how could you do that for what i said he's beating guys because he's big and stronger not necessarily more clever that all of these elements have to weigh into it so when i look for fight of the year I'm looking for all of these, a little bit of all these dimensions. So one of the things that one of the guys in there is Joshua Ruiz, the first one. You know, just a the theater. Oh. The, I mean, it's got to be, it was terrific. I mean, look, you could also say that uh, at the end, uh, Joshua submitted, and and you could say that uh, some of the punches were a little wide. It doesn't matter. It was it was theater. It was an un incredible upset. Uh, it was... You know, it was it was what you want to see in behavior for maybe not at the end the way that the champion behaved that he spit the bit a little bit or a lot, but at the beginning where the challenger, the big underdog, last minute notice, he gets dropped. You know, he gets dropped. It was like a movie. That fight he, hit everything. Rob and I were he there. Comes, he comes off the floor. Rob and I were there ringside. It was one of the most exciting fights so I've I, ever attended. So that's going to be on the radar. Definitely. You, you know, for all of those reasons. <clears throat> Let's not forget too that I contributed to Ruiz's win when I told no, him no, to stay that's loose. True. No, you did. You that's true. That's a big <laughs> part of it. And there should be something for you for that. Well, it was of nice of the hall to like put up a little plaque at the Hall of Fame commemorating the fact that I did that. You remember they gave me that little plaque? Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> and, and and the boxing writers of, of America, yeah. you know, they have their dinner coming up. And I, I think that there should be you know, some Assistant some, Trainer of the Year. Something. <laughs> there should be some recognition of that. And for the people that missed it, and, you know, I don't know how you missed it, and you didn't understand this, but Ken was in a real good seat, and there's Ruiz being held up a little bit like they try to do. You know, the, the champion's making him wait. He gets the privilege of coming in the ring last, and he's making Ruiz, you know, wait and sweat it out a little bit. And, you know, maybe, maybe the moment Ken... Ken recognized and he felt that maybe the moment was starting to grab Ruiz around the neck a little bit. And he looked a little tight and he was just standing there. And then all of a sudden, Ken, because he wants fairness, he wants a competitive fight, he's looking out for the underdog. It really spoke to him. He looked, he saw, and he said, Andy, move. 
Don't don't just stand there. Move. Keep 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 the blood flowing. Come on. Move your hands a little bit. Stay loose. Stay <laughs> loose. And he did. And you know, he gave a wink to Ken. He he stayed loose and um he pulled off the upset. True story. So true story. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna go right up the list. So I started with those ones. Uh, I'm gonna say that also on there, and this is tough for me to say because I was involved in it, but I think fair is fair to both fighters that better be if and Vosik belong on that list. It was a terrific fight. We lost the fight. Uh, we uh, Alex, my fighter, was doing a tremendous job. He was winning going into the tenth. We got uh, we got worn down. Uh, the punches behind the head didn't help, mm -hmm. uh, but no sour grapes. We got beat. We got beat. Uh, all credit to Better Beef. I said it already after the fight, so I don't have to apologize for what I'm saying or say it again. Uh, I give him all the credit in the world. What a tough son of a gun, relentless, strong, physical, tremendous puncher, tremendous force. Uh, he's the, he, he won the fight because he's got of a chin, the, took some uh, shots. Everything. He, he, he deserved it, but Alex fought a hell of a fight, mm -hmm. and they both did. They both did. Uh, uh, there was back and forth. There was the sixth round where Alex, you know, caught him and, you know, had him uh, had definitely uh, got his attention and stung him. And it was uh, Alex had the right idea. He was fighting the right kind of fight. Uh, it was just a matter of, you know, it, it finally wore us down. And um, that was a that was a one of them. The other one, I would say, Charlo Harrison, uh, too. Which, uh, Terrific, uh, terrific fight. Uh, surprise. Again, the theater of the unexpected where Harrison, even though he had beaten him the first time, he was the underdog again. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought Charlo, that at the end, Charlo pulled it out. But Harrison was, was dominating that fight. It's it probably was too one-sided in some spots, not enough back and forth for it to be the number one, but it definitely is on, again, it's on the list. Uh, it was terrific. And um, again, even though Harrison had lost to him, uh, I mean, Charlo had lost to him the first time, again, he he was the favorite. He was the bigger, stronger guy. Uh, but I said it before, Harrison flipped scripts on him, and not only the first time he outboxed him, this time he backed him up. Mm -hmm. It was it was really it was really a good fight. Uh, the other one is Triple G and uh, Derenchenko. Uh, that that was a terrific fight. Excellent fight. A lot of people uh, a lot of people knew Derenchenko uh, could fight. He he had lost a decision to Jacobs, and he was a good amateur. Uh, but they didn't think he would be Triple G. He could have won that fight. As far as I'm concerned, I, I could say that he might have won the fight. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the end of the day, he didn't get the decision. He threw more punches. Triple G, maybe it's fair to say, landed the more, the heavier uh, punches and the the more damaging or eye-catching punches. But uh, Triple G, he showed that he's got one foot out the door. He, he, you know, the shadow's coming up coming up to him. You know what I mean? It's coming up to him. Yeah. It's, it's starting to get there. And uh, one thing, maybe he was sick. There was rumors he was sick. He looked tired early on. Uh, he, he really, obviously, was not vintage Triple G. But he's getting old. I think it will be really important to see how he looks in the next fight. Because like you said, yeah, there's so, a million things that could have been going on. But I'm surprised that... Canelo didn't that that the zone didn't make that Canelo triple G three as soon as they saw that fight because to me Canelo should have been like oh I got you him. want to know I'm gonna go you know we don't we don't mince words we don't use kid gloves we we tell the people what they might not hear somewhere else because somewhere else they might be trying to play both sides or mm -hmm. they're being diplomatic or or they they have a dog in the race an agenda a dog in the fight so to speak an agenda um but no no we just canelo good chance he knocks him out a lot of people are gonna go nuts now triple g oh my goodness here they come well oh, i got away from that one oh, well go away. here they come they're they're gonna start throwing uh, they love triple g i love them too everything i, I just want to say but one i'm just thing. saying at this stage in their career he, if you haven't noticed that, open your eyes. He, the Triple G being he, has aged. And there is no really weighing how much those two tough fights took out of him. I think they took a lot out of him. And 
Canelo has been improving. The one thing about Canelo, he's been improving over the last five years. Triple G got to a point where he wasn't. He wasn't getting any better. He was just strong and tough, and uh, that was enough. And then when he fought the middleweights, that was a little tougher. It wasn't quite as dominant as it was when he was fighting the small guys that were a little older, the European guys. Um, but on HBO and all that stuff. But I'll tell you, uh, he, at this point, I wouldn't be shocked if they fought again. I don't think they're going to fight again. I don't think Canelo's done that, been there, done that. Even though I think that Triple G, and I know it hurts the zone because they gave all that money to Triple G. To both of them. To, to both of them to make that, well, part of it was to make that fight. Just like ESPN gave all that money to Fury to make the Wilder fight, and they made it. Yep. They made, so somebody should get fired, probably, but uh, the way this world works, uh, who knows? They'll get away with it. But uh, it's amazing the incompetence high up in some of these companies it, 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 it's shocking people say oh come on a guy like that's got to be smart a guy like that who's running a network who's doing this who's got to be smart. no i think no, they learned a lesson no. there this is all new signing someone for that kind of deal is a new structure streaming is new and i don't think they counted on the fact that canelo might have some pushback on the opponent and i think when they did they probably realized this is just my speculation that when they realized what was written into the contract that oh shit, maybe we gave him too much leverage in terms of picking the opponent and he's exercising yeah. it to the full extent. And, and listen, I thought, I, I'd say, I thought that talking to what I'm saying, probably people wouldn't think I'm going the direction I'm going and say what I'm about to say. But this is a man who thought that Triple G won those two fights. I thought he won those two fights. I but, agree with you. But that was then, this is where we are now. Canelo might stop him if they did have a third fight he he might possibly stop him because he's fresher he's gotten better triple g i've seen no improvement in him really uh for the last five years or so or when he was with his fighter what was his name sanchez or, yeah, it was with abel sanchez, uh, sanchez and now he's with well um, now he changed uh Kronk. yeah and you have to give him a little more time banks but but and, banks. yeah banks got him at a late stage but when it was with the sanchez I just didn't see any improvement. But, again, he made plenty of money. He was a tough guy. He, he behaved like a fighter. He was terrific to watch. Uh, and I didn't think he got the fair shake in those fights against Canelo. But, again, Sterenchenko, he looked old. Uh, there's one thing that was still there. His great, 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 great character. Mm. Sick, not sick, old, not old, tired. Definitely, you could see all that. Whatever it was, he wasn't himself. And he dug the way great ones dig. He dug and he dug and he dug. And my God, every time you look like he's going back there, breathing through his mouth, he'd come out the next round and he gave it all. And he found a way. He went to a place where other people never never get to. That, that it, he, he went to that place. And he went to it every round. And he showed that great toughness, that great character, that great championship quality. He being Triple G. And he pulled the fight out. And again, I thought he might have lost, to be honest. Yeah. But he pulled the fight out. Uh, and, you know, I'm just going to... I'm going to say that... Uh, I'm going to say that the X, the X Factor... Maybe if they ever did have a rematch, and I just pointed out all the possible negatives on Triple G's side, that you know Canelo's gotten better, he's he's got more in the tank, all of that. But the X factor is Canelo going up and down. But we see the positive. But the negative could be just like somebody named Roy Jones when he went up to fight John Ruiz, and and then he came back down. He was never the same fighter. Never the same fighter. Now, it's not quite as severe and up, but don't forget, Canelo went up to 175, stayed there, fought. Now he's coming back down a middleweight, super middleweight. That going up and down does something to you. Mm -hmm. It does something to you. I'm not saying, I'm just saying that could be an X factor, factor where we don't know if that's going to affect Canelo. But anyway, that's, that's one of them. Uh, that's Before an, you go on, I just want to add one quick thing. What you were saying about um, Triple G and Canelo and giving your opinions. If you know anything about Teddy and know him the way I do, to think that there is an agenda or there's a bias towards anyone, with the exception of Alex Vosdick, who's obviously like family to Teddy, like we don't really have a preference in giving our opinions, especially Teddy. And, and, even, our and, opinions, even, with, and even with Alex Vosdick, I'm going to tell the truth. Of course. 
Of course, that's po- hopefully why people tune in is because we're just t- speaking the truth and there's no agenda and there's no bias here. So you can disagree with anything that Teddy or, or, or we say, but at the end of the day, we're just giving you our honest opinion. There's no a, a hidden agenda here. This is a fun segment. I like this talking yeah. about the really. It's fun, yeah. and and the way I'm doing it, I'm giving a little breakdown of the fight too. Yep. Not not just saying, well, this one, this one, this one, but a little breakdown of why and how yeah. and you know what took place inside those ropes. And so the another one that's there is and and now as I go up, I'm going to the ones that I think are closer to the top. Uh, and right now, this would probably be my number three. But I think you have to put Josh Taylor in and Rage's progress. 100%. I mean, that, was, that was, you know, uh, I listen, I, I did think that Taylor controlled the fight until progress made a big push later in the fight, yeah. you know. Uh, but it was a terrific fight. It was in London, great atmosphere. Uh, I didn't see a majority decision. I, I thought... You know, good fight, good fight, and Progres made it uh, made a run for it late. But I thought Judge Taylor won the fight. Um, I was surprised that one judge had it. I think a draw, right? Yeah, am, yeah, am I... that's majority decision. And then, uh, but a good solid fight. Uh, maybe you know, just just a just a real nice solid fight with a good solid atmosphere. And and then the other one that I'm going to put number two. Uh, so I guess you're going to know who number one is. I'm <laughs> kind of getting there. Uh, I would put, and it, it's tough differentiating, but I'm going to say Errol Spence Jr. and Porter. That that was a terrific fight. And again, part of, I think, what made this good was that no one expected Porter to really have a chance. Really. They thought that there was going to be, that they really, most people thought that Spence was, and, and listen, he won. So you could say he was, but he was a class above. Mm. And and I think that Porter has improved. I got to give some credit. I, he he's improved. He still he still depends on his tenacity, his his, his relentlessness, his aggression, his his physical force, his physical ability, his physical strength, his, his physical strength. He still depends on that. Uh, but he used to reach forward a lot more, be much easier to counter. He uses a jab more now. Sometimes he'll use his legs a little bit, even though, you know, he's not Fred Astaire. He, he still uses them to mix it up a little. His father has, has improved him a little bit uh, in the last three, four fights. And you still know what you're getting, though. You're getting a truck that's trying to run you over, mm. you know. And I think there was an expectation, maybe on my part too, honestly, that... Spence was a class above. That's where where I think it was surprising to me was that Spence didn't separate himself as much as I thought he would with his more sophisticated ability or sophisticated attack or sophisticated dimension Hmm. where he could counter punch where there there were more things to do he kind of got dragged into Porter's fight Mm -hmm. to Porter's credit where where it was a physical throwdown and and. Porter was able to do that, and because of that, and I don't know if it was indicative, I don't remember the scorecards, probably wasn't, but for me, I don't care what other people say, I can only go by what I saw. I saw Porter ahead in that fight, uh, by a little bit of a good margin, really ahead, really built himself, I I couldn't see it any other way, which was going to be shocking, a big upset, and he's ahead, but then the championship quality even though it didn't show itself maybe in a way I thought it would, the separation of sophistication, you know, slick, a little more slickness. But what started to show itself from Spence was just that, again, that championship heart, uh, that determination. No, this is getting away from me. I'm going to grab it back. And he just fought fire with fire. He came back and he separated himself at the end when he dropped him. Mm-hmm. But, but he was grabbing rounds. He was winning rounds, winning rounds uh, late, getting back in the fight. Uh, because, I, like I said, I had him pretty well behind. And then he, he caught up and went ahead with the knockdown. I think it was the 11th round, whatever it was, late in the fight. And he did it with a nice, I think it was a nice count of... Uh, inside hook uh, so there was the sophistication starting to show itself a little bit but the determination just just the like 
like they say in my son Teddy's business, and he's the scout in the Oakland Raiders. They they say the the dog came out in him, you know, mm -hmm. in a good way. The yeah. dog. In the old days, we used to when a guy uh, didn't have when we someone didn't think he had a lot of heart, they call him a dog. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some guys would say coyote. Yeah. You know, he's got a little coyote in him. You know, <laughs> coyote in him. But um. But no, the dog in a in a uh, in a good way, and the dog came out in him, and he just you know he just bit down, and the two of them just bit down, and that's what Porter does, and it was a terrific fight. It was a it was a terrific fight. Like I said, anytime you got an upset on the horizon, which it looked like it might be on the, on the possibility of an upset and then all of a sudden the champion comes back you know the, the guy who's the favorite in this case Spence comes back and pulls it out and then he drops him late in the fight uh that's obviously that's 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 great stuff uh as I said I, I thought there might have been a little bit more polish polish shown by uh by by Spence in that particular fight but at the end of the day you know he got the job done and uh and then number one, I guess it's got to be a number one. Uh, so I went over about six, right? Mm. About six of them, six or seven. I think I had a 5A and a 5B in there. I'm going to make it, and, you know, you could argue it, but because I think they're all good. In a way, in Donaire. Yep, that's I, my fight of the year as it? well. Yep. So, you know, I mean, first of all, I've talked about this in other episodes. I've talked about a lot of people thought Donaire was shot. We talk about shot fighters. A lot of people thought he was shot. Very similar to when Holyfield was getting ready to fight Tyson the first time. A lot of people thought Holyfield was shot. A lot of people, except Ron Borges, the great writer from Boston, who's a great sports writer, boxing writer. Uh, he, he, he was one of the only guys who stepped up and said no. I think it was like 25 to 1 at the time that Holyfield was an underdog. And, and Ron Borges said no, no, no. Yeah, you're forgetting the man that we're talking about in Holyfield. Well, you're forgetting about mm -hmm. the man. Forget about the other stuff. What's inside him? That's that's something that Tyson Tyson is going to have a problem with. And so at the end of the day, I think it was similar where everyone thought that Holyfield was shot because he had some bad fights. Mm -hmm. He he really look bad he looked like a shot fighter and Donaire had some bad fights and looked like the best definitely the best had passed him by and he was a, maybe a shot fighter but it's that thing that I've talked about before and that custom model my mentor used to talk about a former champion on any given night that might have looked like he's passed himself might be passed himself on one given night it can come back it can come back to him it can he, he can summon the gods you know, he, he can he can be like Thor. Father! You know, and <laughs> give it to me, please. Why have you forsaken me? And then the lightning comes down and it goes into the hammer. And he's back. He's back. And that's kind of what happened. It's happened before. It has happened before. We just talked about Holyfield. And Donaire put it back together for one night against the monster. And that's his, that's his yeah. name, the monster. Uh, and listen, did, he took shots we didn't think he would be able to take at this point in his career from a really good puncher. Part of what helped him, I think it was the physics of it, where th there's a no, in, in a way, is amazing. He's gone up so small. You know, he was like a jockey when he started, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and he's gone up so many weight classes. And you know, imagine him a jockey. You, you're in a tight race, <laughs> like in a Belmont. And then, you know, you got the other jockey go back. And, you know, and, right! Just a short little, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, boy, wow. Anyway, you know, the jockey went down! <laughs> he, I think what the physics of it, what helped Donaire was that he's naturally the bigger guy in a way moving up being a bigger guy down there was able to physically handle the punches a little better being that he was natural you know was yeah. able to survive those punches i think the physics of that played in a little bit but he came back and it was an up back and forth fight uh don really fought a terrific fight what i love about in a way one of the things i love about him is attitude his 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 preparation everything uh his results 
of course. But what I love about him is what I see in Joe Lewis, the great Joe Lewis, who is my number one heavyweight. Ali's right behind him, but I know there's a lot of people have a problem with that. But for me, Joe Lewis was number one. But Joe Lewis was always balanced, Ken. He was always in position. His feet were always under him when he threw a punch. He was never out of position. In a way, he was always in position. His feet are always under him. And that's why he's able to deliver good punches and never fall out of position and get full power because his legs are under him. And it was a terrific fight back and forth when you thought that in a way finally took control of the fight. What happens? Uh, Donair still got something and hits him with an unbelievable punch late. Unbelievable. Mm. And the greatness of in a way in his great chin, that's part of being a great champion sometimes. You have to show that that beard, that set of whiskers, uh, in a way showed it. And, and he wasn't going to let this guy, even though he was having a, a resurgence, a renaissance, if you will, of a career, he, he wasn't letting it be done on his watch. <laughs> the great ones don't. Yep. And, and uh, in a way, it was a terrific fight. Oh, excellent. Two, um, two fights that I would have considered. You didn't mention them, but I'm curious to hear what you think. Uh, the, Jar- the Jared Hurd and um, J-Rock Williams. Was that, um, that, was that in 19? Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're right to really put that in there. That was a really good rumble. No, listen, and again, it had some of the ingredients that, that I just talked about, and you're right, it's fair to put it in there. What ingredients is that, Ted? Well, that it was an upset. It's a, a upset is always good to, to possibly make itself a candidate for a fight of the year or, or fight of the moment. Uh, there was an upset, the unexpected, uh, and, and Williams... Most people thought going into that fight that he had to outbox him because Hurd was the stronger guy, the bigger yep, guy. Exactly. You know, and he was gonna, he was gonna really, he was gonna make a big mistake if he stayed in the box uh, with Hurd. Well, mm-hmm. guess what? He made that mistake. It wasn't a mistake. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a mistake. Yep. He made it right. He made it right because he believed and he did it with technique. He did it the right way. He did yeah. it smart. You know, he, he he did not throw away defense for offense when he was on the inside. Yeah, he was on the inside where you're closer to the guy and more things can happen, but there's also a technique to it and there's a science to it. And and he, he took care of both sides of it. He When he was offensively on the inside, he was in defensive position to make sure that he wasn't going to get caught. So... He, it, it was a terrific fight. You're right. That's that's worth mentioning too. And the other one that I want to mention that is uh, wasn't wasn't a huge fight in terms of uh, box office, but Jose Ramirez and Maurice Hooker, that was a freaking good fight. They were going at it. It went and four then, rounds, right? And yeah, and then Ramirez stopped him. But for those four rounds, was action. No, no, it was a good fight. Really, that was good. a good fight. I because it didn't uh, quite. I, I didn't put it on my list. Yeah. Uh, I I thought the other ones were above it. Um, one thing I want to go back to Donaire real quick, and in a way, you know, as great as Donaire looked that night, here's one of the things that it's kind of like you see a rainbow in the sky. You know, a, a former great fighter coming back uh, on one given night is a rainbow. Mm-hmm. It's a rainbow in the sky, Ken. And, but then you don't see the rainbow no more. It disappears. It's gone. I think the rainbow has disappeared. I don't think you ever see that Donaire again. And that doesn't yeah. mean that for you guys out there that are Donaire lovers that I'm wishing that. No. I'm just, again, using my experience and making my opinion. Uh, when you do what he had to do that night with everything against him to come back at this age and come back and give that kind of effort, it's kind of like squeezing every drop out of a lemon. Mm-hmm. Well, out of an orange. I don't want to uh, use a lemon with a fighter yeah. uh, because they're not lemons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, so every drop, squeeze, and he squeezed every drop, and there's no more drops. Mm. There's no more to squeeze. Yeah. And I think that might be the case that you've seen the best of Donaire, that, that there might be nothing else there to squeeze. Again, but getting back to uh, getting back to the fight that you just... Uh, the, the Ramirez one, Hooker. Uh, Ramirez Hooker. You know, that impressed me. I mean, terrific fight. What impressed me about Ramirez was we know he's a go-get you guy. He's a physical guy. He's a guy that can fight in the trenches, but he boxed too. He he used his jab in that fight with the guy who was a better boxer, the guy who's physically set up to be the better boxer. A little, mm-hmm. you know, a little tall, a little longer, maybe. Uh, he likes to fight on the outside. Uh, everybody thought, oh, gee, this is just about uh, this. This is just about. Um, Hooker and Ramirez. Yeah, this is just about Ramirez. I, I was having a, a dead spot there. Uh, someday that might happen to you, believe it or <laughs> not. But this was all about 
Ramirez having to just get inside, having to physically, you know, own the inside, you know, have having to just invade his space. And it was partly about that. That was the physical advantages of that fight with Hooker being supposedly the better boxer quick on the outside and where he had to fight on the outside. But Ramirez, um, he was able to use, he was able to use his jab. He was, he was able to use his jab. He had to use his jab to take it away from Hooker. He had to do more than just walk in because he would have got counted on the way in. So he had to, he had to have a part of the fight where he was taking away the other guy's most important weapon, the jab. And Romero showed me a jab in that fight that I hadn't really seen and an ability to box. Yeah, you can box and still be aggressive. Roberto Duran was a great boxer. A lot of people would be, their eyebrows would be going up when they hear Teddy, he was a guy, go get you. He was a destroyer. He was a sick and destroyer. He was a boxer. He was aggressive, but he was smart. If you're making a guy miss and you're being aggressive, you're a boxer. If you're using your legs like Ali and you're moving on the outside and you're moving away and, and, and you're catching a guy, you're a boxer. Whichever way you choose to do it, as long as you're getting away from the punches, you're controlling that part of the fight. Mm -hmm. Whether you're doing it aggressively like Ramirez does it or whether you're doing it uh, on, on a defensive slant and with your legs, whatever, on the outside like Ali did it or like Pernell Whitaker did it where you stay right in front of the guy and the guy can't hit you in the rear end <laughs> with a handful of buckshot. <laughs> you, you know, yeah. it's boxing. Mm -hmm. and, and Ramirez showed me that dimension. That, that he could box, that he could, he got full extension on his punches. He didn't just have to get close. And it was, uh, it was an eye opener for me, for Ramirez to, to, for his going forward, that he had that dimension to him, that it could do nothing but bode well for him. Yeah, I'm dying to see uh, Ramirez and uh, Josh Taylor. You know, that would, that would be, uh, that would be terrific. I mean, uh, that would, that would be, but I think Ramirez, I'm trying to think uh, what fights are coming up. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but is, is that fight? I feel like, Rob, if you can look, I think, I think Ramirez is rumored to be matching with someone, but I think, yeah. I think that that fight is on the horizon. I think that's one they're looking to make, and that would be an exciting fight. And listen, I would love to see him, just to keep the conversation going while we're looking, I would love to see... Ramirez and Josh Taylor. You know, Josh Taylor is how poor he's taller, he's longer. Postal. He's, he, he's oh, rumored that, to be fighting Victor Postal. No, Postal. he is. No, oh, he's okay. fighting Postal. Oh, good. Okay. See, I'm, I'm glad I, at least my memory works a little bit. <laughs> because I knew, because we can't talk about that till he gets past Postal. Yeah. And listen, he's got to get past something. Postal, you know, uh, has, he was undefeated. He, he for the title unification to the great Crawford. Mm -hmm. He got beat by Crawford, and then he won a fight, then he got beat again, uh, his second loss to Josh Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, so he, you know, he's he's lost two fights. Um, he's an older guy than Ramirez, uh, but he's got a difficult style post yeah. You know, he's tall, he's long, he's a south, uh, I think he's a, no, he's not a south pole, but he's tall, he's long, he likes to own the outside. Um, he's got a, he was a real good amateur. He's got a very tricky style. Mm -hmm. And the kind of style that, it's funny that we're talking about this because it would give a guy like Ramirez trouble if you didn't have that jab that he showed in the hooker fight. Yeah. See, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> See, you're, you're right on time. Because <laughs> if he was just that sick and destroy guy, Ramirez, Posto would have a much better chance. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a very interesting fight. Mm -hmm. But... Being that he showed the ability to think that way, to, to use his jab, Ramirez being he, uh, as he did in the hooker fight, and that he could get extension on his punches, he's going to have to take the jab away of Postol, being that Postol has some physical advantages as far as length and height. He, he's going to not just walk in because he'll get counted. Yeah. Uh, and again, Postol is a difficult style. Uh, but uh, I, I like Ramirez and, and a big part of why I like him is that he showed me that dimension mm. in the hooker fight so if he gets past if he gets past uh, if Ramirez gets past Postal which again is, is going to be interesting yeah yeah I'd love to see him with Taylor that would be real interesting I mean Taylor being a southpaw uh, fighting in London that's where the money would be although yeah. Ramirez 
uh, also draws well in his hometown. Southern California. Yeah, because he does a thing with the farmers, with the irrigation, with the water. The water yep. There's a water shortage. He attached himself. Terrific cause. Mm-hmm. Terrific thinking of other people, not just himself. There's a strength in a fighter in, in anything, mm-hmm. in a runner, in you, in, in, in a, you people out there. Whatever it is that you do, there's, there's a strength if you care about more than just yourself. Yep. That, 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 that's a dimension that you can bring to the mm-hmm. fight, whatever your fight is. You know, it doesn't just have to be this business. Yep. Whatever, everyone's in a fight. And I think that that's something that Ramirez brings into the ring with him. Ali fought it when he fought. I, I know I'm talking about special guys. I'm, I'm, out, I'm up in Mount Olympus right now. <laughs> but, you know, his religion, his belief, his faith, you know, he, he brought that. Manny Pacquiao brought the Filipino people and the cause of helping a lot of poor people. He brought that into the ring with him. You know, and I mean, the, the, these special fighters, they do. They, they find a strength. In outside sources, mm-hmm. in, in those other places, not not just in the muscles, yeah, you know. And I think that Ramirez, you know, he's fighting for the farmers, for the for the water, and that cause, and people love him for it. He, he that's a strength. He he brings that, and then the fight might be in London because you could draw so many. And you, either way, mm-hmm. but London, you can have those big big places filled up. Yep. You know the the people my brothers and sisters over there that I love, you know, across the pond, you know, you guys fill those theaters. You really do. You you fill those stadiums. Yeah, you, you fill the uh, the what's the big giant stadium? The Wembley. Uh, Wembley. Oh my god, 90,000 people you put in there for Joshua and for other fights and, and stuff. Taylor sold out uh, O2 Arena with Pro Gray. That's yeah. A big arena yeah, too. huge, huge. So I mean, it's terrific. I mean, there's so much more to you guys than thoughts. You know, <laughs> I mean, I never. I, I, I love you guys, and we're joking again, of course. And you gave me that thought board. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> it's unused. There is not. Might disappoint a few of you guys, but no, there is not a dot in my face. No, <laughs> it's, it's just going to be on my wall with no dots, but it's beautiful. And you guys sent it to me, and, and a lot of champions over there, great champions over there, signed it. Uh, you guys are the best. But that would be a terrific fight in London with that atmosphere, those two fighters fighting. Wow. Uh, that would be Taylor and, and Ramirez. Boy, that would be... That, that really would be. And and the thing I like about Taylor, he's dimensional. You know, I always talk about I like guys that are dimensional. You know, he, he's got the length. He's got the height. He's got those gifts. He's a southpaw. He can fight on the outside. He can box. He's got a good trainer in Barry McGuigan yep. Jr. doing a good job with him, the son of the former world champion. And he can fight on the outside, but he can go get it. He could go. He did it with Pro Grace. He went and went to the body. You know, he goes to the body well. He he fought on the trenches with Pro Grace too. You know, so uh, with Ramirez, you would think he'd be on the outside, but he could also handle the fire. You know, with Ramirez on the inside a little bit, it'd be nice. It'd be yeah. nice. And let's not forget the other uh, candidate for fight of the year, uh, courtesy of a Brit. We had um, Tyson Fury and Tom Schwartz. No, <laughs> you threw me there. I was like thinking. Potentially uh, the worst <laughs> fight I've ever seen. <laughs> Ken did not help him in that fight. Wasn't able to help. There's only so much you can do, even when you're a miracle man like Ken. And Ken is a miracle man. Uh. Ken is special, really. But he's magical. But even he, with all his abilities, he could not help Schwartz. Tom Schwartz could have gone in there with a knife. He would have lost. It was, that was a well, the, stinker. He, he, he might have dropped the knife. I mean, We haven't talked about this, but um, when I say knockout of the year, which, uh, which shots come to, uh, which fights come to your mind? Yeah, I didn't give that any thought. Um, let me see. Throw some at me. Throw I got, I've got one A and one B would be both courtesy of Deontay, uh, Deontay Wilder knocking out Brazil and then Ortiz only because Ortiz was beating him handedly for six rounds and one shot that slow motion shot of him punching Ortiz in the head and all the sweat flying off Ortiz's head and just going down I got I've got those two as uh knockout of the year yeah I mean you can't go wrong with look I, I'll preface it I started by saying something I've said on our show before and I say it again because some some of you might not have seen every show and when I say this it'll probably make you it'll probably make you um if you're in a great 
pubs in London watching this, it, it'll make you drop the thought, you know, and uh, it might make you spill your Guinness uh, <laughs> a little bit. But uh, there's a lot of things that Wilder does not do well, a lot of things. But one thing he does, I'm going to say, better than maybe any heavyweight in the history of this great sport, the long, great history. That's This is a big statement. Um, he punches with power. He is the hardest punching heavyweight in the history of this sport, as far as I'm concerned. And and when I talk about there's guys like Tyson, tremendous punches. Oh my God! And Tyson could do it with either hand, so he would have an advantage if you're judging it that way. But as far as not caring about what hand it is, just one hand, one punch. I think Wilder is the hardest hitting heavyweight in the history of this sport for one punch, for that that straight right hand. Um, Ernie Shavers, you know, he was a terrific right hand puncher. Um, Max Baer, going back to the 30s, 40s, uh, tremendous uh, right hand. Uh, again, Max Baer is a good comparison in some ways to Wilder because his form was not the best. He'd be out of position, do things wrong, but he could punch mm -hmm. he had he had tremendous joe lewis you know i know the heavyweights were smaller than i don't care power is power he was oh joe lewis again kind of like tyson he could punch with either hand and he was a great finisher great finisher but and but as far as just if you had to pick one guy for one punch in the history of this great sport i would give the credit and I've been, you know, I've been hard on him, but not in a mean way, just in an honest way. Yeah. Uh, when I think you're supposed to be. Yeah. And that's what we're here for, to tell the truth. But Wilder is the hardest punch I've ever seen in the heavyweight division. And so those, the thing that catches me for those ones you just mentioned is that he started to introduce his new delivery system where he just went out there and threw until he landed. Now he's got a good delivery system. Now... He uses that jab to paralyze you, to to sort of uh, hypnotize you. Uh, and as my man Rob, who talking about guys that are great at what they do, uh, Rob Moore would have to be one of those guys that you would put in there producing this show, coming up there with the video. See how he blinded him with the jab? Yeah, I mean, just right on time. Rob, Rob, is, Rob is the man, you know? And that delivery system where he just starts to left and he never finishes it. He never finished it. He didn't intend to finish that left. It was just to get in his way of vision. It was just to impair his vision, and then the right hand's right behind it where you don't have time in your brain to register. Get ready for that. And then you're going to see the same thing uh, against Brazil over here that Rob is right on top of things. Again, La boom. That uh, punch versus the other one, he looks like he really put his whole body into the Brazil punch. That Ortiz one was so short. It's just like a bop, bop. Like, he wasn't like, look at that torque on that one. Yeah, well, no, he he, he, he raised the elbow and, and turned into it and put his back behind it, uh, everything. And listen, if a guy's going to stand there like Brazil, and I'm not making fun of him, but if you're going to stand there and get paralyzed by the jet and just stand there yeah. for a, a, a beat, it was like a beat. It was like 1-1,000. One, yeah. uh, I guess you could say, you know what, I might as well... Uh, I have the time to make this a uh, hugely powerful yeah. punch. I'll make it a hugely powerful punch uh, if I have that opportunity. But getting back to the ones that you picked with Ortiz and well, both of them, uh, again, it's it's the delivery system that that Wilder has come up with recently. Where oh, it doesn't even land that jab. No, he doesn't Ortiz. intend Just it to land. Just gets him to put his hands but up. But look where it is. It's up high, up around the eyes, where it's just to blind them. You know, it's just to blind them. It's to it's to also make them feel comfortable. Like, look, there's no just danger. going through the motions there's here. There's no danger yeah. here. And he's really perfected this. And he's not the one who invented it. This goes back to to a lot of great fighters in the history of the heavyweight division. Um, Igomar Johansson used it against Patterson when he mm -hmm. when he knocked him out. He blinded him with the jab, hit him with the right hand. Uh, the hammer of Thor, the lightning bolt, whatever you call it, the Swedish uh, heavyweight. And again, this system, this this expertise um, to land the to use the left hand to set up the right, uh, it, it's 
again, it's got a precedent behind it. It's got a history behind it. Egan Mario Hansen did it. Tefilio Stevenson, one of the only three men in the history of Olympic boxing to win three gold medals. Wow. Yeah. A uh, special guy, Cuban national team. Uh, everybody wanted him to come to the United States and fight Ali, but he lived in a communist country mm -hmm. with, uh, where you know he, he couldn't leave and he couldn't fight pro. It was only... Uh, Castro was the ruler over there, the dictator, and he couldn't. So everybody was dreaming about what would happen if he fought Ali. What would he was a big guy, Tefilio Stevenson. Same thing, great right hand, but the delivery system blinded you. Same thing, blinded you with the jab, made you feel comfortable, and then when you didn't realize that the right hand was right behind it. Another guy who, who created that too in his second coming. Some people have a second coming. Some people, you know, have a second life. There is a reincarnation, <laughs> believe it or not. George Foreman proved that. Yep. The second coming of George, he was smarter. He was tougher. You know, he, he, was, he, he wasn't as good physically as he was when he was young and he was a world champion when he was young but he was smarter he knew how to use what he had much better and he created a delivery system unfortunately he used it against my fighter michael moore where he blind you with the jab make you feel comfortable he wouldn't even throw it full range can yeah he would throw it three quarters why because he wanted to lie to you about distance because when he threw it three quarters he made you think that was the end of his punch yeah so that you were safe standing there because you had the end of his punch yeah. guess what there was four more inches mm -hmm. so he threw three quarters to make you feel like, okay, it's safe to stand. No, it's not. No, it's not. And then, boom, full extension of the right hand. And you were still in a place you shouldn't have been. You were close enough to get hit when you thought you were out of range. So uh, all those fighters, and to the credit of Wilder, he, he must have picked it up from these guys, you know, and, and he put it into his arsenal. And he always had the power, but now he's got the missile. To deliver the power. Oh, yeah. You know, he, and, and that makes him much more dangerous. Well, like we said at the beginning, it was an awesome year for boxing in 2019 as far as I'm concerned. We're going to leave it here. Um, thanks for being with us, guys. Hope you enjoyed that one. Again, please check out Teddy's audio, audio book on uh, Audible and uh, Apple. Uh, excellent book. There's a lot of bonus content. If you've read the book, the audio book has a lot of extra content. Give it a listen. Uh, Teddy, thanks for doing this. That it was, was fun. fun. That was really was fun. fun. Yeah. Appreciate you. Guys, thanks again. Appreciate all the support. Peace.